warning. It's dangerous to spend too much people, time with people who think the same way as you do. Right? I spend a lot of my time uh, uh, talking to people at events like this uh, and in my uh, university and my friends who basically pretty much share my worldview, uh, which is a kind of a, a, a left, liberal, rights-oriented, you know, uh, broadly egalitarian worldview. But not everybody is like us, right? And or me, I can't talk for you. Uh, and uh, 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 what I want to talk about today is really is is taking seriously people whose worldviews are actually in some ways quite different. My paper should really be called "Taking Conservatism Seriously," um, and I don't think that we do take conservatism uh, nearly seriously enough. Uh, I want to focus on social protection. I want to focus on what policy makers have to say about, think about social protection, uh, specifically in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, um, I'll explain a little bit more about where this research comes from in a second. Uh, but very focused on what policy making elites, not economic elites, not business elites, but who essentially elected politicians, ministers, MPs, and very senior, generally politically appointed uh, uh, civil servants, bureaucrats. So what do policy makers think about, uh, about these policies? I'm not going to say, I'm not going to try and demonstrate that what they think is important. I don't want to demonstrate that ideas are important. I think that actually when it comes to social protection, uh, it's, fairly, it's fairly clear to me that ideas are important, um, partly because social protection raises very obvious normative issues uh, around who gets what and who deserves to get what. Right? Uh, but I, I'm not going to try and demonstrate it's important. I want to try and under, uh, take, take just... Assume for the moment that it is to some extent important, and then think through: Well, what are the what are the normative what is the normative worldview of people who are influential in policy making in a part of the world uh, uh, which, as François Bourguignon reminded us this morning, is uh, 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 persistently uh, uh, got high levels of poverty uh, and growing levels of inequality. Um, so, the uh, as several people have said. Uh, yeah, including Tom Labour's uh, earlier today, you know, that, that most of the literature and the scholarship on social protection uh, focuses on interests and institutions. Uh, we don't pay so much attention to the world of ideas. Right? There is, of course, uh, uh, some work on ideas, mostly on the global north, contrasting the different ideas underpinning social demo demo democratic approaches, uh, 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 Christian democratic approaches, liberal approaches to social protection, welfare, state building, right? but very, very little really on specifically on the global south, very little on Africa. Uh, in my paper, uh, I uh, sort of summarise a range of research, um, not all of which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, some of it is about what happens when uh, uh, African policy makers broadly defined um, uh, rewrite global policy discourse, discourses in African uh, policy documents. In other words, how things like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are vernacularized when they are when they are uh, 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 reflected or, or, or mirrored to some extent in documents produced by what used to be the Organisation of African Unity, now the African Union, the AU. So the AU and other organisations vernacularize global documents, and you can see a process whereby uh, sort of global policy discourses, including the underlying norms and values. Are, 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 trans are, are modified. Right? I don't, I'm not going to talk about that anymore. What I want to talk about today is primarily research based on interviews with policy makers uh, 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 about policy making. At the very end, I'm going to say something very, very quickly about popular beliefs. Now, the major study, that, really the only major study that I'm aware of, which really focuses on what do elites think about uh, this issue, is a, is a PhD originally a PhD by a Malawian uh, scholar, uh, Chipa Kalebi Niamongo, who, who set out to interview uh, uh, elites in Malawi, not only political elites, but also economic elites and journalistic and academic elites. But she was uh, looking at elites generally, what uh, they thought about poverty and social protection policy. I'm not going to read it out. Uh, uh, you can see it for yourself. Uh, by, the bottom line is, in her account, Malawian elites, except for the academic ones, uh, 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 are uh, pretty uh, critical of the poor uh, and pretty sceptical about social protection policies. 
Right. Now, I think this is really important. To, it's, uh, let me explain why I think it's important before I move on. It's important because a huge amounts of the effort that, that people like me and us and UNRIST uh, deploy in trying to champion, in trying to promote particular policies in places like Africa is to persuade African policymakers that the evidence shows that particular kinds of interventions have particular kinds of benefits, e.g. they reduce poverty. Right? Uh, uh, for the most part, uh, I, I don't think that that is the stumbling block and the constraint on, what, on policy, on, on social protection reforms in Africa. Uh, for the most part, policymakers, I think, think it's not, they don't dispute the evidence that it might have beneficial effects on poverty. They, they think this is not something that they should do. Right? And, and certainly, Klebi Niamongo's research suggested that this was certainly true in, in Malawi. I've been involved with, uh, and which parallels the research that Tom Labour has told us about earlier, we, ran, we were involved in two different research programs, one based in Cape Town, mine, one based in Manchester, that Tom was involved in. Uh, and we were essentially looking at the politics of policy making. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that neither the Tom's or Manchester research nor my use Cape Town research started off thinking we're going to try and interrogate elite beliefs and attitudes. We were really more concerned with what we would now call process tracing around processes of policy making. But in doing so, we interviewed very large numbers of, of uh, and this is true for us as well as the Manchester team, very uh, many uh, civil servants, elected politicians, MPs, and the people who are interacting with them from international organisations and experts and academics and people like us. So uh, this research, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and summarise now, was not collected purposely to, in order to write a paper on elite attitudes. Right, so in the paper, I suggest I think that there's, there's really four key themes uh, which, which come out of certainly the research, the countries where uh, my team did research. Um, and none of these will be a surprise to people who have, who have worked in this field in Africa. The first is, is this extraordinary preoccupation with dependency amongst African policymakers. Uh, that uh, 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 in almost every interview I've ever conducted in, in a number of countries in East and Southern Africa, uh, sometime within the first two minutes, five minutes, uh, 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 I will be told you should never give somebody something for nothing. You should never give them something for nothing. Now, this isn't something which was, I was often told when I was growing up in the UK. Maybe, you know, it, it, it's, uh, but in, amongst African policymakers, it's really important. And it's really bound up with this idea that, 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 there's, that the, way, the, way, the way to solve poverty is not by giving people things, but is, of course, it's developmental, it's teaching them to fish, you know, it's helping them to do things for themselves. Uh, in, in fact, uh, giving them handouts is actually going to undermine their self-reliance, it's going to undermine incentives, etc. Right? So that's a, 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 a very, very persistent argument. And those of you who uh, might, might have seen uh, Jim Ferguson's book on, on, on uh, social protection in Southern Africa, and he discusses this at length. Um, but this goes along... <coughs> oh, oh, sorry. And so one of the implications of this is if you're going to do something for the poor, you should generally do it through workfare rather than cash transfer schemes wherever possible. In other words, you can't transfer cash conditional on work because then uh, 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 you're not giving something for nothing. Uh, that's much, much better than uh, also familiar, or, or, or for example. So um, that's the downside. The upside, I think, is that there's a very recurrent and wide, not universal, but very widespread uh, also emphasis on the possibility of responsibility. And this is precisely because uh, most uh, uh, a African policymakers uh, we've interviewed don't really, they don't, they don't buy into a Western view of, of atomistic individual, individualism. They believe that uh, 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 poor people need to be understood as, as members of kinship groups, communities, and so on. And that goes along with the, uh, the presumption that the collective, the group, the kin group, the community, uh, or potentially even the state, has, on behalf of society, has some responsibility for <laughs> poor people. Right? Uh, so uh, this is most obvious during droughts, where, where no policy makers that we have ever spoken to or I'm aware of, uh, in certainly in East and Southern Africa, would argue against the idea that the state should provide uh, 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 drought relief in times of drought. 
In times of drought, it's treated as axiomatic. Of course, the state has to step in. And we shouldn't forget, this is probably the best example of success in social protection um, we can think of, uh, that in outside of war environments, almost nobody dies of famine in Africa in the last uh, 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 30 to 40 years. Um, so social protection around drought, uh, really important. And elites also accept that uh, orphans, particularly around HIV and AIDS, uh, elderly people uh, in certain contexts, these, are, these are, 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 are people who, through misfortune, have been neglected by their kin group, the community, whatever, um, and therefore are deserving of, of assistance from the state uh, on behalf of society. Um, and th these two themes, dependency and responsibility, are bound up in, in the notion of re reciprocity. Uh, that, uh, that, that, they, that, indivi that poor individuals have reciprocal obligations to other individuals in uh, uh, social groups. Um, uh, and that means that, in fact, you don't want to be dependent because dependency is, in fact, the antithesis of reciprocity. reciprocity. It says poor people are getting something for nothing. Right? So just as uh, uh, society has got some responsibility for the poor, so poor people have got a responsibility to society uh, or king group or the community. Uh, dependency is also a failure of development. Right? And then a final thing, theme which I think is very important is what I'm, I, I'm calling agrarian nostalgia. That most African political elites seriously under it, they don't underestimate poverty, right? unlike uh, the Mexican elites that Alice was talking about, but they, you know, that there is a very wide, good appreciation of the extent of poverty. Right? But they do underestimate the extent to which social change, social and economic change, has transformed society around them and, and that large uh, 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 parts of Africa are no longer agrarian societies of, of peasants, uh, farmers living in interdependent uh, 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 contexts. So in my paper, I give some examples of this. I'm not going to read these out. Um, uh, there is some variation. Uh, here's some quotes from uh, particularly uh, 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 opinionated former Minister of Finance in Zambia, uh, who uh, thought that actually even the elderly shouldn't get pensions because um, you know, it has, you know, they don't want to be dependent in advance. Right. Um, uh, this is, a, I think, the best example I've written about uh, is quite extensively. The first president of, of Botswana, Serezi Kama, uh, who, uh, uh, with his successors, uh, developed, I think, quite a, a, a coherent, conservative uh, doctrine of responsibility, explaining why the state in Botswana uh, should assume responsibility for the poor, and the bottom line there being that Botswana uh, is particularly drought prone, and the Botswana state was really built around uh, uh, drought relief and what I'm conserving, what I call in some other work a conservative African welfare state. Um, but it, as you can see, there's also a strong emphasis on on reciprocity and on the responsibilities of the poor. Uh, themselves, they must work, they can't be idle. Right? Uh, Zona Squia is a very influential Minister of Social Development in South Africa. In South Africa, is seen as a big reformer. In some respects, it's seen what I would see as being quite like Suretsi Kama in articulating a, a, a discourse of responsibility. But if you look at the African National Congress in general, um, by and large, the dominant discourses have been much more conservative. Uh, in fact, even Nelson Mandela, in his inaugural speech uh, as president in May 1990, uh, was very insistent right, that he says, we will confront the scourge of unemployment, not by way of handouts, but by way of the creation of work opportunities. Right, so even in South Africa, which as we'll see in a moment, I think is in some ways a bit of an outlier, conservative views are very widespread. Uh, I think that there's some variation in Africa. If we want to try and map this, this is obviously not uh, a highly quantified exercise. Um, we can see that there is some, there's some variation over uh, the balance between anxiety over dependency on handouts and a sense of responsibility for or solidarity with others. And I've lined up a number there. And I think that there are 
some change over time, and again, you'll forgive my lack of quantification here, um, but Botswana in the 1960s and 1970s was not in the same place as Botswana in the last 15 or 20 years. So it changes over time, and there's variation with Africa, uh, but there's also strong similarities. Um, let me just go straight to, to this. Right, the very final thing I want to say is about public opinion. We know very, very little about public opinion around these issues in Africa. Um, we have some data from the World Value Survey and Afrobarometer, but by and large, the World Value Survey and Afrobarometer ask all the wrong questions. Right? For the most part, because for different reasons, they have their origins in questionnaires that were designed in the global north. It made a lot of sense when you're trying to probe the attitudes and the beliefs of people in, in Northwest Europe or North America, and then for fairly obvious reasons, when those surveys were extended directly or indirectly to Africa, um, by and large, they wanted to maintain the comparability with the existing database. So, by and large, I think they asked the wrong questions. Right? So, we can't get a lot out of them. And it's very difficult to make sense. I've been bashing my head against this. If anyone can make sense of them, I'd be very grateful for some insight. We do have quite a lot of data on South Africa, unusually. South Africa is probably the only African country where we have detailed data. Now, South Africa is a bit of an outlier because it has a very extensive social protection system. Right? One in three South Africans receives a grant every month, uh, either old age pension or child grant for, for children or disability grant. Uh, so these are very, very extensive in terms of coverage. And we can argue about how generous they are, but they're a lot more generous than most social assistance programs across the global south. Um, so, uh, and, and they've been in place for a long time. To some extent, they're taken for granted. Now, unsurprisingly, if we ask in a national survey, we find quite a lot of support for these programs. So, for example, we ask, should the value of the old age pension be increased? Then you can see the, 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 the focus on the numbers in bold. We have very strong support, very strong agreement that the value of the non-contributory old age pension should be increased. Um, and it should be increased even if it means that people like the, the respondents pay more taxes. Right, so there's a, a general presumption there. And just as a little footnote to Alice's talk, in fact, that, that rich South Africans are most in favour of this, for, for, for precisely for the reasons that I think Alice intimated, which is they cannot possibly believe that people could live on as little as the old age pension. So rich South Africans are actually quite generous in, in opinion surveys when it comes to issues like that. And... Uh, so we can see this, this looks like that there's quite strong support, I would say, for social protection, right? even if it means that people like you pay more taxes. Right? But then we can ask other questions which show a much more mixed picture. This is my last one. Um, the, the, we also ask, we, we tried out some standard statements that you often read, you know, that if you listen to talk radio in South Africa, read the media, listen to politicians, they come out with these statements frequently. Right? Um, well, not all of them. Some of them are for real, some of them are for controls. So, the things that people often hear is that young women who get child grants on behalf of their children are, uh, uh, abuse that. Now, we know from people like us who do research on this that actually there's not much abuse of the child support grant. You know, the researchers can't actually find much evidence of it in practice. Right? Um, most uh, most of the money that goes to young mothers for child support grants ends up getting, benefiting the child. And there's lots of evidence of this. Right? But uh, uh, there is this very pervasive uh, discourse that in fact young mothers, or at least some young mothers, are abusing it. So we ask here, in the second row you can see, do young mothers spend too much of their child support grants on beer or other alcoholic drinks? And you can see, you know, we have some, uh, you know, the, the support is rather less, um, uh, uh, it's definitely weaker than it is for uh, some of the previous measures. We put at the top row, it's a control question for elderly people. Nobody thinks that the elderly people abuse their grants. They don't drink, right? Uh, uh, fortunately, you know, maybe fortunately for this question, most elderly pensioners in South Africa are grandmothers, not grandfathers. So uh, gra this is really saying that grandmothers don't drink so much. Right? So grandmothers are okay, uh, young mothers are not. Right? And if you, look at the, the, if you look further down, the third row, you can see 
Do you think that young women have children so they can get a child support grant? There is no evidence of this you know, for, in, from social demographers, sociologists, or whatever. But we can see, whoa, 38% say they agree, and another 29% strongly, sorry, 24% to 26%, 50% of people actually agree that, that, there's, that there's, in a sense, this is a negative incentive. Now, uh, you know, we are social scientists. You know, might you know be, be, go around to policymakers and say the evidence this is very weak, right? But I think that policymakers in South Africa are very aware that mo many of their constituents, right, have uh, quite conservative views about some of their grants. Uh, I can't demonstrate it, but my sense is that even in South Africa, right, policy po politicians' views on social grants are are, if anything, reinforced by the conservatism of their constituents. Uh, uh, and if that's true in South Africa, it's even more likely to be true in the rest of Africa. Thank you very much.